anniversary of, I believe, the birth of Walt Whitman, but um, we had some unforeseen circumstances that kept us from having uh, Dr. Panapacker do his speech for us, his little class, and, um, but he's here today, so we are so lucky. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of his CV because it's quite impressive. He's formerly the Dume Professor of English at Hope College, where he's taught since the year 2000, which, you know, that seems like just recent, but it's 20 years ago. That's amazing, isn't it? He arrived from Harvard University, where he earned a master's and a PhD in the history of American civilization. He's the author of Revised Lives, Walt Whitman, Religion, and 19th Century Authorship as well as numerous articles and book chapters on American literature and culture. Dr. Panapacker has been awarded more than $2.3 million in grants and has recently become the Senior Director of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Programs and Initiatives at Hope College. His lecture and discussion on Whitman focuses on the poet's life and work in the context of the greatest crises in American history the Civil War in the present moment. So welcome, Dr. Panapacker. And if you have questions or comments as we go along, please enter them in the chat and I'll try to get them together for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amy, and uh, thank you, Kim, and thanks to all of you for being here for this uh, long postponed talk. Uh, as Amy said, last year was the 200th anniversary of uh, Witten's birth and a time of many celebrations. Uh, it was also uh, a time of many postponements. For me, I went through a, a double total knee replacement that set uh, my schedule back quite a lot. Uh, but now I'm back walking around again and glad to be talking about my favorite 19th century American author. Um, as Amy said, um, if you have uh, comments or questions, I'd like this not to be a, a one-way presentation, but something that's a bit more of a dialogue. And there are many byways and detours that we can get into. Uh, regarding Whitman, who's sometimes described as, as a kind of vast continent. Uh, if you begin studying Whitman, you find connections to virtually everything in 19th century American history, literature, culture, the arts, and it's often enjoyable to find ways to make connections to the things that we already know uh, with a poet like Whitman. He was a kind of uh, omnivore. Uh, everything around him uh, became material for his poetry. And his body of work is enormous. This is a, a bibliography of all of his publications in his lifetime. He was, of course, best known as the author of Leaves of Grass in many editions over a period from 1855 to 1892. But he was also the author of an extraordinary amount of journalism, uh, magazine poetry, uh, many other kinds of writings, small books, uh, contributions to larger books, and so on. Today, I mainly want to talk about uh, why Whitman matters uh, 200 years later, what's important to know about him, um, what are his major contributions uh, to American literature and world literature and culture, uh, and why is he still worth talking about. I want to shift over to uh, screen share and uh, walk through some images talking about um, Whitman. Uh, at the same time, uh, I'd like to, to ask a question of the group and maybe get, get some input from uh, Amy about that as the answers come in. Um, what is your prior experience with Whitman? Um, for example, in high school, this would have been in the 80s for me, I think I read O Captain, My Captain, and probably uh, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, which is, they're both good poems. Well, Crossing is a great poem. Uh, but that's about it. Uh, of course, I also grew up, uh, I was born in Camden, New Jersey, and where Whitman spent his final years, or last 20 years, really. And uh, then really uh, was raised in Philadelphia, where uh, Whitman's influence is still present. There's the Walt Whitman Bridge. Uh, he was uh, someone who was deeply connected with the literary culture of that city during the years that he was in Camden. And so for, for whatever reason, growing up in Philadelphia, I ended up becoming interested in Whitman and Benjamin Franklin and Edgar Allan Poe and Owen Wister and the other writers of that city. So to a great extent, my interest in Whitman was shaped by 
uh, growing up in a place that um, was still in some ways haunted by his presence. So, oops, let's see if I can get this to work. What's the first thing that Whitman is known for? Of course, it's Leaves of Grass. And it was published in 1855, the first edition. This is, this is not an actual copy of the first edition. It's a, it's a facsimile. And I, I get it out here just to give you a sense of scale. It's a, it's a pretty big book. It was meant to, to make a, a large impression on the people to whom it was sent. Perhaps the, the most famous recipient was uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Only about 800 copies were printed. Whitman had training as a printer and he made them himself. Uh, later on, he would say, um, this, is, this is no book. This is the man himself. He put so much of himself into it. He set the type, he chose the paper, he, he bound the pages, he made the covers, all of that. He put a lot of himself into it. And all of the subsequent books would continue that theme. Though he didn't print them all himself, he tried as much as possible to get it himself as a human being into the text, to, into the book itself, to break down that barrier between uh, the author and the reader. Um, uh, at one point he said, it's like I'm, I'm jumping from the pages into your arms. And uh, there's always this feeling that when you're, you're reading uh, Leaves of Grass, that there's a kind of ghostly spectral presence of Whitman. There are lines in, such as Crossing Brooklyn Ferry where he says, I'm with you, you men and women of a generation or ever. So many generations, hence, just as you look, I look. And uh, I'm with you now, even though you cannot see me. Um, he described this um, book as a great American new Bible. And what he meant by that is that uh, scripture, from his point of view, he was a Quaker, brought up Quaker, is still being written and that he wanted to contribute a book to it. When he sent this to Emerson, um, Emerson didn't quite know what to make of it. Whitman by then had become a, a student of his work, texts like The American Scholar and Self-Reliance, which emphasized American newness and originality, that we had to break free from the courtly muses of Europe. And that meant breaking free from old poetic forms. And the first edition of Leaves did all of those things. It was an astonishing book, maybe the greatest intervention and innovation in poetry since ancient times. And when Emerson got it, he, he responded um, in an extraordinary way. He wrote to Whitman and uh, the letter begins, I greet you at the beginning of a great career, which must have had a long foreground somewhere for such a start. When Whitman uh, produced the um, second edition in 1856, he actually put a line from that on the spine of the book. I greet you at the beginning of a great career, R.W. Emerson. He didn't ask Emerson's permission to do that. He also reprinted the letter in full in the book. But Emerson was a big deal. He was the sage of Concord, the father of transcendentalism in America, author of Nature and many other important books on an on international scale. And so an endorsement from Emerson was uh, pure gold for the advancement of Whitman's career as a poet some strange things too about the book to, to consider. Um, one is the, the frontispiece of Whitman on the left. Uh, the book is unsigned too. Uh, you'll find if you read Song of Myself, get more deeply into it, uh, there's a, a, a part that begins, uh, Walt Whitman, one of the roughs, a cosmos of Manhattan, the sun. Turbulent, fleshy, sensual, eating and drinking, no standard above men or apart from them. And so the, the image here is not necessarily of Walt Whitman, though it does look like him. If you go to the Walt Whitman archive, where you'll find all things Whitman, it's, it's the great online scholarly repository, you'll find a section of images there tracking hundreds of them. He's probably the most photographed individual in 19th century America. Um, you'll see that he does look like this at that time. He underwent a kind of transformation to starting out as a journalist, but then presenting himself when he became the author of this book as a kind of rough American working man. He doesn't take off his hat before authority, he stands kind of jauntily and anonymously as a kind of American, um, universal American self. Uh, Leaves of Grass too is a kind of symbol. We'll come back to this later. I wanna take you on a, on a walk through parts of Leaves of Grass to, to give you a sense of the machinery of it and how it works as poetry. But of course, grass is not um, you know, an orchid. It's not a, a, you know, a lovely individual flower. It's, it's, a, it's a composite of 
many things. It's a collective. So in the section where he describes uh, grass, he says, uh, oh, I perceive after all so many uttering tongues. And so these blades of grass are the collective voice of the American people. And it comes out of Brooklyn too, a kind of melting pot uh, of the uh, American scene in that era. There are eight editions of Leaves of Grass. There's some, perhaps more, depending on how you count them. He kept reworking and expanding the book. After that first round of uh, about 800 copies, which it got around, um, Emily Dickinson is supposed to have gotten a copy, though it wasn't sent directly to her. Um, she said before that that she had heard of Whitman somewhere, but believed that he was dreadful. They're often paired together in courses now as the, the two most influential poets of 19th century America, and, and quite contrasty that way. Uh, others, many editors got them. I'll, I'll show you a couple of reviews. Uh, the second edition was much smaller, and uh, it was meant to be a pocket book. He, he described how this book would be dispersed across the American con continent, and sailors would carry it around in their pockets, and uh, farmers would have it, and they'd sit out and you know in, in between the the mowing of the hay, they would sit and read Leaves of Grass in the Open Sun. Images like that never happened. Um, Whitman did not become popular as he had hoped. Um, he published another edition, finally got a, a major publisher. The publisher for 1856 was um, a phrenological publishing house, you know, the reading of Bumps on Your Head, very minor publisher. Um, they published the book think, thinking of it as a kind of medical text which it, to some extent was considered. Uh, it was about uh, healthful, healthy, a guide to healthy living. Whitman published a separate section of it called Walt Whitman's Guide to Manly Health and Friendship. In any case, um, the book didn't take off. He got a, a better publisher for the third one, Thayer and Eldridge in Boston, which was the heart of publishing, literary publishing in the US at that time uh, in 1860, 61. Um, Unfortunately, the Civil War came at that time and nobody was interested in reading poetry once that started. So that book uh, piled up as remainders and is still among the easiest to find, although not certainly not cheap. Subsequent ones came out with editions uh, and changes. The, po the poems are constantly evolving. Leaves of, or Song of Myself in particular is constantly changing. And it's a kind of cottage industry among Whitman scholars to chart the various changes and the, the parts of it as it proceeds. In the beginning, I, th I would say my favorite is 1855 because it's so raw and so different. It's, um, it's unlike what comes later. It's, it's like the grass becomes more of a topiary garden by the last edition. Uh, and that's fine because it reflects, the, it kind of charts the evolution of Whitman's thinking and the, the changes in American culture as it crossed the great divide of the Civil War uh, and into the Gilded Age. Whitman was always anxious about the, the fate of the United States, but all, always too very hopeful about it. So by the time we get to 1892, we have the deathbed edition. Uh, Whitman worked on it almost up to the day he died. And um, by that time, he had achieved a little bit more popularity. Um, in 1881, um, the book was uh, banned in Boston. And so he took the plates and had it published in Philadelphia, where it suddenly took off. And, Philadelphians and others bought it as a point of pride uh, to uh, cast some kind of judgment upon those prim Bostonians. Uh, it's kind of mid-Atlantic New England rivalry that persists to this day. So anyway, Leaves of Grass, lifelong project for Whitman from 1855 to 1892, uh, constantly evolving, a moving target, um, the first thing for which he's known. Second thing is that he is probably the the main embodiment of the romantic movement in American literary culture. And there are any number of ways of, of defining it. Uh, it's kind of a hand-me-down romanticism for Whitman, perhaps through Emerson, who got his romanticism from Coleridge and from the Germans. Uh, but one way of defining it might be a belief in progress guided by the imagination of the artistic genius. It's very different from the age of reason that came before. Think of writers like Benjamin Franklin, uh, who, for example, describes um, his relationship with his wife in terms of how well she kept his shop. Uh, practical relationship, not about the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. And Whitman is not a rationalist. He is all about feeling. And truth doesn't come from the empirical, from things that are measurable, but from intuition, from 
uh, what Emerson would call, and Kant too behind Emerson, the transcendental, that there's, there's a higher knowledge. And the artistic genius through imagination is able to access that higher knowledge, go up to the mountaintop as it were, like Moses and bring down the, these commandments, uh, these rules for, for better living. And the main one I think for Whitman is the empathetic connection with other human beings to not be an isolated individual Maybe the, the great example of the isolated individual in that era's uh, US literary culture would be Captain Ahab. Captain Ahab, who is alone in his cabin on the Pequod, who is cut off even from God, uh, whose quest to destroy the white whale is ultimately his own destruction, but the destruction of everyone around him. So the isolated individual uh, is just as it's uh, anathema to Melville, it's anathema to Whitman even though he presents himself as this great individualist, I celebrate myself and so on. But he then goes on to say what I assume you shall assume for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. In other words, we're all part of the same greater oneness, this same creation, but we all can stand apart separately as well. Terry Eagleton once described this as being like a jazz, a vision of a jazz performance in which you all work together at points, but then you all have your solo performances and it goes back and forth. It's, dialectical in that way. Whitman, you know, as we've seen before, this, this figure that he presents is very much in the tradition of the romantic artist, the rebel, the individualist, the visionary, lover, adventurer, egotist, loner, savage, prophet, madman, martyr, mystic, and revolutionary. He will die young and unrecognized, but his work will save the world. And it is kind of, kind of gendered in the figures of that time. Um, certainly Beethoven and Byron we have as uh, ex exemplars of that. It takes, it's a huge claim for what a poet can do. Um, the idea that a poets, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin said, his father, Benjamin Franklin's father said, when his son tried to write verse for the newspapers that poets are generally beggars and he'd better go into a trade in which he can earn a living. Um, Whitman managed to earn a modest living, mainly through donations and some book sales and, and journalistic writing. But he made these huge claims and following Emerson too, uh, and following Shelley saying that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world, that that literary culture, artistic visionary work moves out ahead in an avant-garde way of um, the culture in which the author is embedded. Um, and that the truths revealed by that author are going to change the culture in ways that will advance it forward. Um, and Whitman ha very much has an agenda. He has, he has a goal. And the main goal that he has is a nationalistic one. Ultimately, though, it will become a global one. And that is the, the comedy of all human beings with each other, the sense of connectedness that will diffuse the sense of antagonism that people have on the basis of difference. Um, maybe I should pause there and ask Amy if anything's come up with regard to prior history of Whitman or questions. Um, just that uh, uh, Judy Parr studied selected poetry in American Lit survey course at Hope College, and I did too. Oh. And, uh, and another viewer said has, has little knowledge, so we are, we are ready for you. All right, well, I'll, I'll give you the uh, Whitman 101. And... Um, where to begin now, uh, Whitman is born on Long Island in 1819. He has a, a kind of rural boyhood. He comes into the city in his youth. He works a variety of jobs. He's a school teacher, he's a printer. Um, he ultimately becomes a journalist for a lot of papers. There are dozens of them at that time in Brooklyn and New York and, and writers and editors move around freely between them. They tend to be very political. Uh, he's, um, his politics are, are hard to define. Uh, he was not a party hack by any means. He's forming his own sensibility from his reading and experiences. Uh, he's, he says that during these years in the 1840s, the long foreground that Emerson alluded to, that he took in the city. He had this rural boyhood, but then he came to the big city, this, this um, emerging megalopolis with people from all over the world, all classes, all religions, all races, all ethnicities, everything. New York is in a, in a cauldron. And Whitman is taking it all in high and low. And during those years, and largely under the influence of Emerson, but he's also deeply steeped in the Bible, 
and in political oratory. And if you were to name the three major influences, it would be Emerson, the Bible, and political oratory. He, he gives a political speech at one time. And, um, accounts say nobody could hear him. But nonetheless, he was thinking about a career in politics at one point, but it never came to much. Uh, most of what he did during those years was journalistic writing, and there are thousands of pieces of, of journalism. Behind me are um, all these, mostly these volumes of Whitman. The red ones up top there are, are largely his uh, diaries and journalistic uh, pieces. And those pieces form a kind of workshop for what would come later. The, if you go and look at, at the journalism, you'll see images um, that will appear in Song of Myself and other places. So he's, he's uh, learning to be a poet by experiencing the city on top of his youthful experience of the country. He's, you know, unlike Thoreau in a sense too, that Thoreau is a writer who goes out into at the Walden Pond and writes about nature and tries to find higher truths through nature. Um, and he does it alone. Uh, Whitman is an individualist, but you don't get the sense of him as ever being fully alone. Perhaps maybe he is, but he's an observer. He's always amongst his fellow citizens watching them and identifying with them. And he's about the country, but he's not limited to the country. Something happens to him. It's, 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 um, this image is sometimes called uh, the Christ-likeness of Whitman. He does seem to have gone through some kind of spiritual transformation in the early 1850s. And, and his vision became less one of a, a kind of uh, acerbic uh, boulevardier uh, describing the city and into someone who has a big idea. And the big idea largely, I think, comes from, from Emerson and that is the oneness of all things, the nature, the city, all human beings. And that vision of oneness is coming at a very difficult time in American history. It's probably most comparable to our own. So maybe if you've seen the movie Gangs of New York, it's set in the Five Points. Here's an engraving Courier Knives, I believe, in uh, 1859. And it is a, uh, at that time, uh, a violent, terrifying place of open warfare in the streets between uh, uh, old stock Americans and new arrivals, the Irish in particular. And it's, in the movie, and, uh, and in reality too, these gangs are often have to be put down by uh, militias and reading the, having the riot act read to them. It culminates, of course, in 1863 in the New York City draft riots when big percentage of the city burned and militia had to be called in and shooting at crowds and the houses of the wealthy were pillaged and uh, African Americans are lynched in the streets. Um, this was um, what Whitman had feared would come, a kind of a, a apocalypse in this diverse and uh, if not welcoming, at least inclusive city. And what he saw emerging in New York in the 1850s, he clearly feared would become uh, the fate of the United States moving forward. And, and he was not wrong. The Civil War is often was seen at the time as a kind of American um, apocalypse, that all of the dreams that had been built up upon the, the vision of what the United States would be were about to be dashed, uh, even though there was hope for uh, a new birth of freedom, as Lincoln put it, and a manifest destiny where we would be a continental nation uh, rather than a uh, an East Coast one, or East Coast and Southern one, divided very strongly uh, by um, the view of slavery, among other things. So this is perhaps for me, and this has grown increasingly true with time, the most important reason why Whitman matters. And that is that he had a vision of how you could take many different kinds of people from all over the world different religions, races, classes, beliefs, and have them live together in harmony. Not forcing them to all believe the same thing or become the same, but allowing them to be who they are and to live in peace through sympathetic, empathetic identification with each other. Ed Folsom in the um, American Experience documentary about Whitman points out that the key idea in Whitman's poetry is to look at someone walking down the street, imagine yourself in a city, in New York, it's the 1850s or, or now, and you look at a person and they are completely unlike you, 
you, you assume that they vote for the other candidate. You assume that all their beliefs are misguided. You, uh, uh, you feel yourself filled with animosity towards that person. And Whitman says, no, that person could be you. And that person over there could be you. And that person over there could be you. You are you and you are entitled to be who you are. But remember that you are tied to all of those other people. And out of all of those people, I'm about to weave the song of myself. That's the essence of Whitman, the diffusing of intergroup tensions. And I think that's the thing that matters most. But I want to back up from that and try to, to walk us towards some other things uh, about Whitman that are uh, important. Here's what Whitman had to do. I want to pause there maybe and see if, if Amy has any questions that, has, that have come up. Um, well, I have a couple of questions. One is, um, you said that he was constantly revising in addition and adding to Leaves of Grass. Was that just like throughout the whole piece or did he add things to the end? Well, if you, if you, for example, if you look at Song of Myself, which is the, the key poem in Whitman's body of work that expresses his whole philosophy, um, it also has a prose introduction, a preface to it that does, says the same things only in a prose form. Whitman is, is um, a multi-generic writer. He expanded Song of Myself, um, enlarged the catalogs. We'll look at some of those catalogs. In eight, I think the key way of describing them, but from 1855 to 1892 with, with the poem Song of Myself, is that in 1855, his vision was primarily a national one. He wanted to save the United States, and he wanted it to grow and become a beacon to the world. He had that, that vision of um, uh, you know, the US as a savior nation, even at that time. Uh, but by 1892, on the, across the Great Divide of the Civil War and the U.S. holds, he, his vision expands to become a global one. So, so it's not just about saving the United States, it's about saving the entire human race and saving it by teaching people to, to love each other rather than see each other as inherently uh, enemies. Um, he also adds many other poems. Uh, hundreds of them are added. The book keeps getting thicker and thicker over time and his interests will change we'll next time we'll look at what he does during the civil war and in the years after and it's often about his life his life experiences the 1855 edition and 56 and even 60 are the poems of a younger man with grand ambitions the um the poems after that become the experiences of a man who's aging who's hopes have been checked by reality, who feels his, his body uh, starting to, to lose the vigor in which he prided himself when younger, but also gaining in a kind of wisdom. He's a less combative poet by the end, uh, but I think no less a good one. He's just a different one. Often the, the, the poems that he writes later in his life are seen you know, as less exciting. They are less innovative, but they're, they're no less powerful and moving. I, I think a great example of that are his, the, the poems that he writes about death, contemplating his own death. And I, I found them only interesting as a literary scholar before until I, I read them uh, during my father's final illness and found consolation uh, in them that way. And so there, it's, it's, I think this is to say that he, his life experiences charted what he did in his poetry. And some would say that his retroactive revising of what he had done in his youth marred that work. But you can have 1855 and 1892 stand alongside each other as in two instances of the same person, um, as we all are. Um, we're never the same person uh, one day after another. And so Whitman gives us multiple slides of, of who he was, a cross-section of who he was through time, and with that, a, a cross-section of America through time. So here's some, here's, um, we're back to that frontispiece. And this is what Whitman says about himself, which I alluded to before. Walt Whitman, a cosmos, the egotism of this, of Manhattan, the sun, turbulent, fleshy, sensual, eating, drinking, and breeding. No sentimentalist, no standard above men and women or apart from them, no more modest than immodest. You can see why this might've been shocking in 1855 this is another point about Whitman is that he's going to get colloquially a language into the poetry and he's also going to be very frank about um, sexuality in the body 
Um, this is um, why John, Reef, John Greenleaf Whittier, the famous Quaker poet, was said to have purified his copy of Leaves of Grass by fire. <laughs> <laughs> it shocked people. And, and some of it is still pretty shocking. If you, know, if you read through it, you'll see, you, you can see the, the reference. It's, not, it's indirect, it's not pornographic but it is high, erotically charged in a way that, that would have been shocking for the time. And there's a philosophy behind this, which is that everything that, everything that is understood correctly through the right eyes, through the transcendentalist's eyes is good. And things that are evil in the world come from our inability to, to see things truly and clearly and to behave according to those true beliefs. Uh, some of this might sound like Quakerism and no doubt it, it traces back to that, but it's also the transcendentalist vision of, of universal oneness, that, that the fallenness of the world can be undone through a changing in our perceptions. Um, of course, he said, you know, after, after the frontispiece years later, this is the older Whitman, sometimes I regret that engraving. It looks like I'm saying you be damned. And I asked my daughters years ago, well, here, let's, let's switch back years ago what they thought of this, uh, this particular engraving. And um, Jessica, my, my six-year-old said, uh, he looks like he's dirty, like he had been moving rocks. <laughs> and I've, I've been building a rock garden, I think the week, the week before that, and I probably looked, looked dirty. Like, but the idea, of course, is that this is not meant to be a, a fussy guy in a parlor writing, writing poems, but a, but a rough, tough American working man. You can see the, the genealogy of that going from Whitman to someone like Ernest Hemingway that the, the charge of the poet as a kind of effeminate person disconnected from the world versus the, uh, the poet as rough, tough, manly man out there on the front lines getting the story. Um, Whitman, Whitman's in that, in that history. Whitman is also important for getting colloquial language in poetry. Uh, lines like, uh, shoulder your duds, dear son, and I will mine and let us hasten forth, wonderful cities and free nations we shall fetch as we go. I'll talk about this language too shortly, but words like duds or this, if you tire, give me both burdens and rest the chuff of your hand on my hip, and in due time you shall repay the same service to me, for after we start we never lie by again, the chuff of your hand. So he's he wrote a dictionary too in the early 1850s, uh, collecting American words uh, American slang, and he wanted to get that slang, that authenticity of the spoken word as he as he experienced it uh, into the poems. And that was radical for the time too, because the language tended to be very formal and highfalutin and so on. Uh, and Whitman wants to be uh, a representative of the uh, the demotic, the, the people writ large. So let's, um, if there are no questions, let's turn to Song of Myself. And the beginning of it. And, and I'll, I'll try to gloss on this a little bit, ex explain, explain it a little. And then later on, we're going to get into the kind of hypnotic trance effect of this, which uh, um, is really the most interesting thing about what, what Whitman was doing. So it begins, uh, I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. So in the beginning, we have the dialectic of the self and the other, the individual and the community. Yes, it begins with I, but it ends, but that stanza also ends with you. And he's make, creating a bridge between the I and the you. And that will characterize the poem all the way through. It's also not a poem that begins with, with warlike statements, say like the Iliad or the Odyssey. It's a, it's a languid opening. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass, not a spear for war, but a, a blade of grass, contemplating the individual blade of grass, but it's also plucked from this field as well. So this too is a dialectical stanza of the individual and the community, uh, but it's also putting himself into a, a place of reverie where the muses and the imagination uh, can be summoned and can inspire him to speak. And so he does. My tongue, every atom of my blood, formed from this soil, this air, born here of parents, born here from parents the same, and their parents the same. I, now 37 years old, in perfect health, begin, hoping to cease not till death. 
So he's beginning a kind of poetic ministry. Uh, he's, and, and he's emerged, it's like he's emerged out of the soil. Uh, he's, he is um, an emanation of, he's like Adam being created from the soil here. Um, the characteristic American uh, self who has come from generations preparing for this moment. So it's important to remember to this moment of rising up out of the soil, because when we get to the end of the poem, we'll see him descend back into the soil and we're, le we're left alone to decide what to do, having met this uh, character. So to go on, creeds and schools in abeyance. So set aside your preconceptions, your beliefs. Uh, listen to what I have to say. Resting back a while sufficed at what they are, but never forgotten. Uh, he doesn't want to reject your beliefs but he wants you to consider some new ones, a more integrative and holistic vision. I harbor for good or bad. I permit to speak at every hazard, nature without check, with original energy. So from the creator, original energy. And for the transcendentalist, nature with a capital M is, is the, the means by which one access, accesses, at least for many, accesses the deity, that it's not uh, from texts, uh, ideally, it's not from uh, um, churches, it's from nature in all of its majesty. That is the, that is the book of the creation. Have you, reckoned a th next slide. Have you reckoned a thousand acres much? Have you reckoned the earth much? Have you practiced so long to learn to read? Have you felt so proud to get at the meaning of poems? He's going to turn us into a different kind of reader. Stop this day and night with me and you shall possess the origin of all poems. You shall possess the good of the earth and sun. There are millions of suns left. You shall no longer take things at second or third hand, nor look through the eyes of the dead, nor feed on the specters in books. You shall not look through my eyes either, nor take things from me. You shall listen to all sides and filter them from yourself. It's very much like Emersonian self-reliance. It's about getting away from received knowledge, away from what others have written, and even away from the, the prophetic voice that Whitman tries to present here. He doesn't want to tell us what to think. He wants to give us the tools to think for ourselves and to commune directly with, with God and God as, uh, as emanating through one's fellow human beings. Well, okay, so that's kind of a key to it. It's the opening. Um, Reviewers didn't, unlike Emerson was pleased with it, although he didn't fully understand it. Reviewers like Rufus Griswold, who's most famous for having defamed Edgar Allan Poe, uh, said this, an unconsidered letter of introduction has oftentimes procured the admittance of a scurvy fellow in a good society. And our apology for permitting any allusion to the above volume in our columns is that it has been unworthily recommended by a gentleman of wide repute, Emerson and might on that account obtain access to respectable people unless its real character were exposed. So Whitman, perfect for the way Whitman wants to present himself as a kind of interloper into polite society. Uh, someone who's going to say rude things, uh, but perhaps gain a few converts to his point of view, uh, having done so. This is a, a kind of repeated story in the, in the uh, 1880s, Whitman tried to, or was, was put up for membership in Boston Saturday Club, a literary society, and, and somebody blackballed him. Uh, and he never got to speak to the New England literati there. But uh, it served his interest to say that they didn't want, they didn't want him in their presence, like they, they couldn't compete with the power of his message with their dainty little poems. Charles Eliot Norton, who was one of those Boston literati and a friend of Emerson, Harvard professor um, uh, in Putnam's, gave a, a, a review that actually is pretty good. Um, he said, on account, our account of the last month's literature would be incomplete without some notice of a curious and lawless collection of poems called Leaves of Grass and issued in a thin quarto without the name of publisher or author. The poems, 12 in number, are neither in rhyme nor blank verse, but in a sort of excited prose, broken into lines without any attempt at measure or regularity and as many readers will perhaps think without any idea of sense or reason. The writer's scorn for the wanted usages of good writing extends to the vocabulary he adopts. Words usually banished from polite society are here employed without reserve and with perfect indifference 
to their effect on the reader's mind. He would later say that Whitman was a strange mixture of um, a, a, a New York fireman and a New England transcendentalist. And that's, that's pretty good. Um, here's a review from um, the United States Review in New York, 1855. An American bard at last, one of the roughs, large, proud, affectionate, eating, drinking, and breeding, his costume manly and free, his face sunburnt and bearded, his posture strong and erect, his voice bringing hope and prophecy to the generous races of young and old. We shall cease shamming and be what we really are. We shall start an athletic and defiant literature. We realize now how it is and what was most lacking. The interior American Republic shall also be declared free and independent. And by now you're probably on to the actual authorship of this review and it's Whitman himself. <laughs> he published quite a few of those um, and the language itself is almost taken verbatim from that, that part about Walt Whitman, a cosmos, one of the roughs. But he was a little bit like P.T. Barnum, his contemporary, his nearly exact contemporary, uh, in that there was no such thing for Whitman as bad publicity. Even when people uh, hated his poetry in the press, it, it stirred up controversy and the debates between uh, those who admired what he was doing and those who despised it helped to advance his reputation. So I'll we'll stop there. Any, any comments or questions? Okay. So he's also, so maybe that's one thing for which he's known. He was a kind of literary P.T. Barnum. He was, he came out of nowhere and, and he made himself uh, the preeminent American poet of the 19th century. Well, Longfellow was at that time, but Longfellow is seldom read anymore and neither is Whittier. Um, his only rival on the, the stage of American literary history in that time is Emily Dickinson, also an unknown. Um, so if, if you're looking for an author who in the American sense is a self-starter, self-promoter, entrepreneur, it's hard to do better than Walt Whitman. Um, he's also important for having, a, a, as Charles Eliot Norton said, developed what he considered a kind of excited prose without rhythm or meter, uh, kind of free verse, as it would be called, for free Americans. It's, it's not as if he invented free verse, but he certainly pioneered it and, and helped to popularize it. And the influence of that popular, excuse me, popularization is felt to this day. There's no poet who's had more influence than Whitman. And uh, even now it's, it's hard to find poetry that uh, hews to the more traditional verse forms that were common and set the background against what Whitman was writing. He saw that kind of poetry as um, derivative of European culture, and he wanted to create something that was, as he said, autochthonous, that came up out of the soil of um, the, American, the American scene, rather than something that was a second-rate form of European writing. So if we talk about free verse, um, you might think of it, you know, reviewers, Griswold, among others, would say, oh, this is lawless. You know, there's, uh, he's thrown away all the rules. This isn't poetry. Um, James Russell Lowell was asked, you know, is, is it poetry? Uh, and, and Lowell became Whitman's enemy and said, no, he shouldn't be admitted to the realm of poets. He's, um, he's not really a writer of any sort. He's just a New York journalist trying to get attention. But free verse is actually, it can be, and in Whitman's hands, especially over time, can be very tightly constructed, very carefully wrought. And so if we begin to, to analyze just the opening of Song of Myself, uh, you can see this first in the, the repetition of words. So we in this case, we have I, 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 I. We have my, my. Uh, we have assume, assume, belong, belong, repetition of two and two, loaf and loaf, my and my. So this, this repetition of words uh, creates a, a kind of mellifluous quality that helps to hold it all together. But wait, there's more. You've got the repetition of phrases. So I celebrate, I assume, I loaf, I lean, my soul, my ease. And there are inherent pairings going on between those phrases. And then there's consonants, the, represent, the repetition of consonant sounds. Um, I cel celebrate. 
self, sing, self, assume, shall, assume, as, belong, soul, ease, observing, spear, summer, grass. And then you have the bees, celebrate, and belonging, and belongs. And so it gets even more complex. Then you have the repetition of vowel sounds, those E's, celebrate, self, self, every, belonging, belongs. And then the A's, and, and, at, a, and grass, and and, and shall, and assume, and atom. It, and then you've got alliteration, the repetition of the first letters, sing, and shall, and good, and grass, and loaf, and lean, and loaf again, and soul, and, and so on. And then you've got antitheses, opposites, especially I and you, me and you. So all of that makes it, when you read it, it, it does seem like spoken word, like this could have been an utterance, but you can see how tight, it, tightly written it is. And it creates a kind of incantatory and hypnotic quality that um, we'll delve into a bit more uh, in a few minutes. Also, the whole of Song of Myself is held together uh, by the grass as a symbol. I've said a little bit about this already, but let me read this passage, and you'll see. Um, a child said, it's a very kind of biblical moment, too. A child said, what is the grass fetching it to me with full hands? How could I answer the child? I do not know what it is any more than he. I guess it must be the flag of my disposition out of hopeful green stuff woven. So the, the book, woven fabric. Or I guess it is the handkerchief of the Lord, a scented gift and remembrancer designedly dropped, bearing the owner's name some way in the corners that we may see and remark and say whose. So the book of nature as a, a conduit to the, the mind of God. Or I guess the grass is itself a child, the produced babe of the vegetation. Or I guess it is a uniform hieroglyphic. This is the Egyptian revival era. You remember the Rosetta Stone? And it means sprouting alike in broad zones and narrow zones, growing among black folks as among white. Canuck, Tuckahoe, Congressman, Cuff, I give them the same, I receive them the same. So a radical egalitarian vision for Whitman of uh, all Americans are created equal here, black as well as white, native uh, as well as European. Uh, I receive them the same. Uh, and now it seems to me the beautiful uncut hair of graves. So we're in a cemetery at this point. And remember that for when we come to the end of the poem. The grass is very dark to be from the white heads of old mothers, darker than the col colorless beards of old men, dark to come from under the faint red roofs of mouths. And then we come to the end. And of course, when you ever, whenever you see O oh, in a romantic poem, you know you're about to hear something that's kind of an epiphany. It's very important. It's like the, uh, the Puritan sermonizers, uh, polysyllabic, yay. So here we are. Oh, I perceive after all so many uttering tongues. And I perceive they do not come from the roofs of mouths for nothing. And he's going to tell us what they have to say. So it'll be a, a not monoglossic, but heteroglossic, as the critics say, um, a, uh, the, the uttering of many voices that will harmonize into one. And then later in the poem, he says, I believe a leaf of grass is no less than the journey work of the stars. This is when, this is in a later edition when his vision becomes global and cosmic rather than nationalistic and the running blackberry would adorn the parlors of heaven. So I always thought this was a great line. And a mouse is miracle enough to stagger sextillions of infidels. So it's, it's if you know Blake, um, it's finding the cosmos, finding God in the smallest things. Um, the Hudson, think of the Hudson River School of Painters in this time, the glorious sunset paintings, you know, majestic landscapes. It, it seems almost too easy to find the transcendental in the sublime that way. Whitman will give us the sublime, but he's also going to give us the very small and, and teach us to find uh, greatness, uh, to find the awesome, the divine in the smallest things. 
So the way the poem, well, let me stop there. Questions, thoughts, things to respond to. There is a, a point for clarification when you talked about the self-promoting of uh, Whitman and compared it to P.T. Barnum. The question was, is that the same as the one who had the circus? Yes, and, and the American Museum in New York, and, uh, which Whitman went to. And in some ways, the American Museum was a compendium of all kinds of bizarre things uh, that, that Barnum found. And Whitman was often accused of writing a, a book of poetry that was like a museum. Uh, a cabinet of curiosities uh, showcasing all, all manner of uh, prurient and bizarre uh, artifacts that were to, to draw the public in and then kick them out at the end, not, uh, not having understood what it all, what it all meant. Um, so, and you know, interestingly enough, Barnum and Whitman never met, but, but Whitman was very much aware of Barnum. I don't think Barnum was very much aware of Whitman. So, um, one way of understanding Song of Myself, too, is, and this is part of Whitman's poetic form, and, and this is one of his innovations, is that it works according to cycles of expansion and contraction, like the beating of a heart. That's the structure of it. Uh, or some connect it with um, Eastern religion, too, this cycles of birth and death and rebirth. And so Whitman uses that uh, to organize the, the long poem. And in the beginning, of course, it's about this kind of panoramic vision of Manhattan. We'll start with Manhattan, and then we're going to cycle out into all of America, and then we're going to come back to Manhattan. And you can imagine this cinematically, right? You've got the camera on Whitman, and then it broadens out into Manhattan. And then it panoramas across the United States, and then it comes back to Whitman again, the the prophet poet who's telling us this who's who's in some ways summoning this this huge vision of course you you preempted me with regard to uh the, the thing about the uh, whitman as a the creator of an american museum i wasn't thinking particularly of barnum but it's a great comparison this is this is peel's american museum which was upstairs at independence hall uh in the late 1700s where he displayed paintings of, the, of American flora and fauna, as well as curiosities like the bones of the mastodon um, that were, I believe they were dug up on Jefferson's property. And so in some ways, Whitman is lifting the curtain on an American museum. He's gonna show us everything and then bring us back to uh, what it all means. I've talked already a bit about Whitman's transcendentalism. And the, again, the key idea about that is the oneness of all things, uh, the oneness of the city and the country, the oneness of all human beings. Um, and Whitman will, will emphasize that point repeatedly. This, one way to think about Whitman too is to, is to let go of the rational. We're talking about how Franklin uh, is a supreme American rationalist. The age of reason was preceded romanticism. You have to let go of your reason in some ways to get Whitman. And so one way to think about him perhaps is a kind of mystical whirling dervish. Um, if, you, if you try to analyze him line by line, you lose the bigger picture. Back in the 60s, they, they saw him as a kind of, I think some people would describe him as a stoner mystic, uh, somebody whose ideas don't make a lot of, a lot of sense uh, uh, in the cool light of reason the next day, but in, in, the, um, in the intensity of the moment, they seem uh, absolutely mind-blowing. And the, this edition, edition in the 60s seemed to capture that. Another thing about what I mean, I'll come, I'll come to attempting to replicate that for you. But um, another thing about Whitman, too, in terms of Song of Myself to bear in mind, is that you'll remember in that passage from the beginning how he said, you're not going to, you're not going to uh, take things from me. You're going to learn how to see things for yourself. Uh, the idea is that the, the, the best teacher is the one who is no longer needed at the end of the course because you have been transformed by uh, the experience of having been shown a, a, a new way of seeing things. So let me re read this to you from farther on in the poem where he returns to that theme. This is what he says. These are really the thoughts of all men in all ages and lands. They are not original with me. If they are not yours as much as mine, they are nothing or next to nothing. If they are not the riddle and the untying of the riddle, they are nothing. If they are not as close as they are distant, they are nothing really hear the biblical cadences behind this too. It's like Ecclesiastes. Uh, 
This is the grass that grows wherever the land is and the water is. This is the common air that bathes the globe. It's a later edition. This is the meal equally set. This is the meat for natural hunger. It is for the wicked just the same as the righteous. I make appointments with all. I will not have a single person slighted or left away. The kept woman, sponger, thief are hereby invited. The heavy-lipped slave is invited. The venereal e is invited. There shall be no difference between them and the rest. Do you guess I have some intricate purpose? Sometimes I feel like he's like Yoda here. Well, I have for the fourth month showers have and the mica on the side of a rock has. Do you take it I would astonish? Does the daylight astonish? Does the early red star twittering through the woods? Do I astonish more than they? This hour, I tell things in confidence. I might t not tell everybody, but I will tell you. I am the teacher of athletes. He that by me spreads a wider breast than my own proves the width of my own. He most honors my style who learns under it to destroy the teacher. So we come to the end of the poem and he set this self, he set this up now for the dissolution of the teacher. Um, since we're using Star Wars references, it's like uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, after he's gone, he's still in the mind of Luke Skywalker and, and shapes uh, his training, but his training cannot advance until he finds a superior teacher and then becomes his, his own master ultimately. The spotted hawk swoops by and accuses me. He complains of my gab and my loitering. I too am not a bit tamed. I too am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yawp, that should be over the roofs, roofs of the world. I depart as air. I shake my white locks at the runaway sun. I effuse my flesh in eddies and drift it in lacy jags. I bequeath myself to the dirt. Remember he was in the graveyard at the beginning to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to catch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. So it's a book about spiritual transformation in the 1880s, he had this, this photograph made with a, a butterfly on his finger and the butterfly motif would be in, in the books uh, from that time forward. Somebody asked him, was that a real butterfly? And he said, yes. Eventually we, the scholars found the butterfly tucked away in one of his books made of cardboard, but uh, perhaps he had a larger point to make. Whitman is also a, a cataloger of American experiences. He wants to, as I said, get the whole of the continent into his works. And so we have some images here that might remind readers of, of James Fenimore Cooper or Herman Melville, others who are trying to get subject matter uh, in, into, their, into their writing in a way that just wasn't, wasn't that common yet because of the preoccupation with uh, European uh, culture. The most popular writers in America in this time are William Shakespeare and Sir Walter Scott. So here are some nice instances of the, the American scene in Whitman. Alone far in the wilds and mountains I hunt wandering amazed at my own lightness and glee. In the late afternoon, choosing a safe spot to pass the night, kindling a fire and broiling the fresh killed game, falling asleep on the gathered leaves with my dog and my gun by my side. Two literal critics would say, you know, Whitman, you're not a frontiersman. What are you talking about? But what he's saying here is this image is something that I can fully identify with and project myself into as an American. And then we go into a maritime image. The Yankee clipper is under her sky sails. She cuts the sparkle and scud. My eyes settle the land. I bend at her prow or shout joyously from the deck. The boatmen and clam diggers arose early and stopped for me. I tucked my trouser ends in my boots and went and had a good time. You should have been with us that day round the chowder kettle. And here's a crucial image too in the 1850s as the, after the Fugitive Slave Act, which very nearly nationalized slavery. Uh, and as the nation moves increasingly close to the Civil War, the runaway slave came to my house and stopped outside. I heard his motions crackling the twigs of the woodpile. Through the swung half door of the kitchen, I saw him limpsy and weak and went where he sat on a log and led him in and assured him and brought water and filled a tub for his sweated body and bruised feet and gave him a room that entered from my own and gave him some coarse clean clothes 
and remember perfectly well his revolving eyes and his awkwardness and remember putting plasters on the galls of his neck and ankles. He stayed with me a week before he was recuperated and passed north. I had him sit next to me at table. My firelock leaned in the corner. We don't know, Whitman was never an abolitionist. He was more of a free soiler, but you can see his sympathies extending in that, in that direction here with uh, a, a determination of violent resistance against the, uh, the fugitive slave uh, act that would have brought this, uh, this refugee back uh, into the South. So here's another instance of this where he tries to, ca to capture the American scene in an urban setting and listen to for the use of vernacular language as well as all those strategies of holding together free verse that he employs. Someone once said that, that he had, Whitman has a, a good mouth in the sense that, that when you speak Whitman's poetry, you can sense how it works, how it's organized and constructed better than when you read it. And I'd recommend that you do that. It's really, I've always done this with students, the first class we read through the whole of Song of Myself and by the end of it, they have, they have a stronger feel for it than they otherwise would if they had read it silently. The blab of the pave, tires of carts, slough of boot soles, talk of the promenaders, the heavy omnibus, the driver with his interrogating thumb, the clank of the shod horses on the granite floor, the snow sleighs clinking, shouted jokes, pelts of snowballs, the hurrahs for popular favorites, the fury of roused mobs, the flap of the curtained litter, the sick man inside, born to the hospital, the meeting of enemies, the sudden oath, the blows and fall, the excited crowd, the policeman with his star working his passage to the center of the crowd, the impassive stones that receive and return so many echoes. I mind them or show the resonance of them. I come and depart. It has a kind of acceleration to it. And also it occurs to me now this image of urban violence and the bare preservation of order that this poem sets itself against in trying to create uh, that, kind of, that sense of comedy. And then we go into another place, and into, the, the, into an elite setting. The pure contralto sings in the organ loft. The carpenter dresses his plank. The tongue of the foreplane whistles its wild ascending lisp, so the high and the low, but connected through this music. The married and unmarried children ride home to their Thanksgiving dinner. The pilot seizes the kingpin. He heaves down with strong arm. The mate stands braced in the whaleboat. Lance and harpoon are ready. The, you see how this is going faster, too. The duck shooter walks by, silent and cautious stretches. Remember the whirling dervish, he's going faster and faster and faster. The deacons are ordained with crossed hands at the altar. The spinning girl retreats and advances to the hum of the big wheel. The farmer stops by the bars as he walks on a first day loaf and looks at the oats and rye. The lunatic is carried at last to the asylum, a confirmed case. He will never sleep anymore, as he did in the cot in his mother's bedroom. Now, by this time, I've been glossing on it, but uh, as we, we, we see these images, they're a bit longer, and then they get shorter and faster and faster, and there are hidden connections that are beginning to be revealed between them. And if you, if you listen to this, just let me read it, read through this a bit more, um, and just kind of let your mind blur with it and, and go into a place not of hearing or analyzing specific things, but feeling all of these images blend you know, maybe they're like a Venn diagram that starts farther, the circles are farther apart, but the circles are coming closer and closer together. And ultimately that Venn diagram is not a bunch of overlapping circles, but one circle, uh, transcendental oneness. Okay, here we go. The Jour printer with gray head and jaunt, gaunt jaws works at his case. He turns his quid of tobacco while his eyes blur with the manuscript. The malformed limbs are tied to the surgeon's table. What is removed drops horribly in a pail. The quadroon girl is sold at the auction stand. The drunkard nods by the barroom stove. The machinist rolls up his sleeves. The policeman travels his beat. The gatekeeper marks who pass. The young fellow drives the express wagon. I love him, though I do not know him. The half-breed straps on his light boots to compete in the race. The western turkey shooting draws old and young. Some lean on their rifles. Some sit on logs. Out from the crowd steps the marksman takes his position, levels his piece. The groups of newly come immigrants cover the wharf for levy. As the woolly pates hoe in the sugar field, the overseer views them from his saddle. The bugle calls in the ballroom. The gentlemen run for their partners. The dancers bow to each other. 
the youth lies awake in the cedar roof garret and harks to the musical rain. The wolverine sets traps on the creek that helps fill the Huron. The squaw, wrapped in her yellow hemmed cloth, is offering moccasins and bead bags for sale. The connoisseur peers along the exhibition gallery with half-shut eyes bent sideways. As the deckhands make fast the steamboat, the plank is thrown for the shore-going passengers. The young sister holds out the skein while the elder sister winds it off in a ball and stops now and then for the knots. The one-year wife is recovering and happy, having a week ago born her first child. The clean-haired Yankee girl works with her sewing machine or in the factory or mill. The paving man leans on his two-handed rammer. The reporter's lead flies swiftly over the notebook. The sign painter is lettering with blue and gold. The president holding a cabinet council is surrounded by the great secretaries. On the piazza work three, walk three matrons, stately and friendly with twined arms. The crew of the fish smack pack repeated layers of halibut in the hold. The Missourian crosses the plains toting his wares and his cattle. As the fair collector goes through the train, he gives notice by the jingling of loose change. The floormen are laying the floor. The tinners are tinning the roof. The masons are calling for mortar. In single file, each shouldering his hod, pass onward the laborers. Seasons pursuing each other. The indescribable crowd is gathered. It is the fourth of the seventh month. What salutes of cannon and small arms. Seasons pursuing each other. The plower plows, the mower mows, and the winter grain falls in the ground. The city sleeps and the country sleeps. The living sleep for their time. The dead sleep for their time. The old husband sleeps by his wife. And the young husband sleeps by his wife. And then finally, this centrifugal or centri centripetal and centrific come, become centrifugal and all comes together. And these tend inward to me, and I tend outward to them. And such as it is to be of these, more or less I am. And of these, one and all, I weave the song of myself. So he's taken us on this whirlwind tour, all these images one after another, and in seeing them, flapping them flash, you see all the peoples and experiences of the, of the American continent. And in the end, he brings them together and shows that how they are one. And there's that crucial line too about uh, um, the young man who, who drives the cart and how he says, I love him, though I do not know him. It's the extension of that sympathetic, empathetic imagination into an urban setting where people would be expected to be antagonistic towards each other rather than loving each other, rather than being sympathetic, empathetic with each other. That may be Whitman's biggest poetic uh, innovation, uh, this ability to cultivate in the reader the sensibility that uh, he seeks to uh, project as his own awakened and prophetic imagination to transform the reader into somebody who shares that vision, doesn't merely imitate it or, or analyze it, but shares it. Of course, another big thing about Whitman is the all-inclusive subject matter. He was like his uh, near contemporary, the painter Thomas Aikens in Philadelphia, uh, who famously lost his, his job uh, in the uh, 1880s, 1880s for removing the loincloth from a, a male model in a figure painting class that was primarily women. Uh, he Aikens emphasized um, the human body in his work and getting it uh, accurate, depicting it accurately. And like Whitman, he suffered to, to some extent uh, for the attitudes of that time with regard to the representation of the body. Whitman does this very much in his poetry. He did it in advance of, of Aikens. This was a real problem for him in terms of getting his work uh, before the public, and he was often um, criticized and censored for it. Here's an instance. Um, the Children of Adam poems, of course, the great example of it. Uh, every kind for itself and its own, for me, mine, male and female, for me, those that have been boys and that love women, for me, the man that is proud and feels how it stinks to be slighted, for me, the sweetheart and the old maid, for me, mothers and the mothers of mothers, for me, lips that have smiled, eyes that have shed tears, for me, children and the begetters of children. Undrape, you are not guilty to me nor stale, nor discarded. I see through the broadcloth and gingham, whether or no, and am aroused, or not aroused, around, tenacious, acquisitive, tireless, and cannot be shaken away. So Whitman is, is a, a, 
a, a perceiver of beauty in, in the human form and in human expressions of love of, of all sorts in that time. Whit, uh, Emerson had a long walk with Whitman prior to the publication of the third edition in 1860, where he says, you know, Walt, your, your poetry is so innovative and interesting and, you know, it really could break through and become influential if you could just get the, uh, the sexuality and representations of the body out of your poetry. And, and Whitman, or at least be more oblique about it, and, and Whitman said, no, I can't do that. If I, if I cut that out, I might as well cut everything out. Um, the dirtiest book is an expurgated book. And the, the essence of the poetry is this kind of revelation that what is in the world, um, the things that are prohibited are the things that one must look at and try to find uh, the sacredness in. So I mentioned this story earlier. I think I only have a few minutes left. But he finally gets into trouble regarding this uh, in the 1880s uh, when he's finally he's breaking through and being published by Osgood. They eventually become Houghton Mifflin, uh, big publisher. And the book, before it could be sold, had to be reviewed by um, the Office of the Postmaster General to make sure that it was suitable for sending through the mails. And it's deemed to be pornographic. And so... Osgood gives Whitman the option of taking, just as Emerson suggested, of taking those passages out, and um, he refuses to do so. So Osgood withdraws publication. Whitman takes the plates, uh, stereotype plates, and has it published in Philadelphia, as I mentioned earlier, where it becomes a huge bestseller. A lot of those volumes are around from 1880-81, um, relatively inexpensive compared to the other editions. But one thing that you'll find is that the pages are very often, they're not cut. Uh, these books have not been read, but they were purchased, and Whitman ends up becoming a champion of freedom of expression. Uh, and the example of Whitman begins to open up space for poets going forward, think in the 20th century, someone like Allen Ginsberg, uh, for including subject matter uh, and including their perceptions of, of truth as, uh, to be expressed in any form that they choose. Not that they too won't face censorship and criticism, but that, that Whitman's example of having pushed the boundaries with regard to subject matter uh, opened up possibilities uh, for poets going forward. He was champion of freedom of expression for his time, uh, but also a very shrewd manipulator of the dynamic in, in U.S. culture about, uh, on the one hand, being, being somewhat uh, uh, guarded with regard to, to content, and on the other hand, being very much celebratory of freedom of expression in the First Amendment. Well, this is where we're going next time. Um, Whitman's uh, time after the Civil War. This, the, the first phase of Whitman's career leading up to the creation of, of this new poetic form, the first edition of Leaves of Grass, uh, in response to the tensions, partly to the tensions that are leading up to the war and wanting to assuage them to prevent war, the war from coming. But once the war comes, Whitman signs on for it wholeheartedly. Um, and there's a book of poetry that uh, I would encourage you to look at for the next session uh, that Whitman wrote during the war years called Drum Taps. And if you want to narrow your focus on those, on that work a little bit, you can find Drum Taps, by the way, on the Walt Whitman archive uh, in its original form. And if you, you look at that collection, it's, it's also a book about spiritual transformation. The first major poem in that is called Beat Beat Drums. And it's an incitement to war. It's, it's Whitman saying, the war has come. Everybody get ready, get your guns, let's go fight. And it, you know, if you've seen Gone with the Wind, you remember everybody cheering because the war has arrived. Uh, and Brett Butler coming out saying, you know, you're all gonna die. And then the, the, the poem takes Whitman to the battlefield and he begins to see the, the sights and suffering of the battlefield and his heart starts to change. And there's a poem at the center called The Wound Addresser. Uh, so it, instead of becoming a soldier, Whitman decides to become a nurse in the hospitals of the Civil War, tending to both the Union and the Confederate soldiers. I, I think it's one of the best poems Whitman ever wrote. It's, it's so balanced and powerful. And finally, the, the collection comes to a poem called Reconciliation. The war is over. Uh, the Union will survive. Um, America's potential as a redeemer nation is, is still there for Whitman but he has to reach an accommodation with everything that's happened. And um, it's a marvelous poem about coming to peace with 
great loss. And then the, after drum taps was completed, on top of it all, Abraham Lincoln is assassinated on Good Friday, no less. And Whitman stops production on drum taps and creates a sequel to drum taps, which includes the famous poem, Oh Captain, My Captain, and also When Lilacs in the Dooryard, Last in the Dooryard Bloomed, which I'd encourage you to look at also. Drum Taps, I think, is the key work after Leaves of Grass for Whitman. But we'll also look at Whitman's years after the war um, when his, his poetic voice shifts from this assertive young revolutionary poet to one who is consolidating his reputation, temporizing that voice, becoming a, a Gilded Age um, eminent Victorian, and, uh, and setting up uh, a pilgrimage site in Camden, New Jersey, to which the entire world comes. Uh, the British first, uh, continental Europeans, Canadians, and then ultimately the Americans by the end of his life, beginning to recognize that uh, in their midst, they had had someone who essentially created American poetry uh, while they were reluctant to acknowledge what he had done because they were still uh, uh, complying with the expectations that uh, literary culture had for them through most of Whitman's life. And we're at uh, 10.51, and I'm supposed to stop at 11. This is a good time to pause for observations, questions, other thoughts. Okay, so um, when you were um, talking earlier about how Whitman emphasized that we're all part of each other, uh, the comment was made that that was an important reminder and message for today. And um, when you were reading the, the um, acceleration poem uh, stanza, the comment was the feeling is like today's peaceful protests becoming uh, looting and then becoming violence and then becoming gunshots and, uh, and feeling like apocalypse. Um, and uh, then the comment also, the sections of Song of Myself seem disjointed one to the next. He seems to move from one topic to a completely unrelated topic, at least at the first reading. Do you have any comments about that or are we gonna? Well, I, I think you can read that, uh, that acceleration as a, a kind of almost in a cinematic way that, um, it's like montage. Uh, this, this, I think, was done in the World's Fair in the 1960s. The, the Ames has created this, this image of the US and the Soviet Union. And they showed images of people, boom, 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 like that, uh, Americans and, and Soviets. And they're the same. You know, Their lives, the, the stories of their lives are the same. There's a famous book that came out in that era called The Family of Man. And, and it was meant to, to show through this rapid fire sequencing of images how what people perceive as difference really is all uh, the common human experience. Uh, so, so I wouldn't say that, that Whitman is calling for um, dissonance or disharmony. He's using that acceleration to create that kind of the, that merger, uh, that transcendental oneness between different kinds of human beings. The structure of Song of Myself is very confusing without the key to it. And the key is that, that idea of cycles, that um, we start with the poet, and then we're going to cycle out into this panoramic vision of America. And then we're going to come back into the poet again. And then we're going to cycle out even more broadly to uh, an even bigger panoramic of America. And then subsequent editions, the, the world and the cosmos. And then we're going to come back to the poet again. And then the poet is going to vanish beneath our boot soles. And we're left alone having been through this vision. Um, it's meant to bring about a change. It's, it's meant to enact a kind of um, transformation in one's perceptions that will turn one into a transcendentalist, a romantic, that is, is able no longer, that is no longer able to focus on difference, but is able to focus on common humanity. I found it really helpful when you mentioned that it was like looking at exhibits in a museum. I thought that that was a really good insight that helped me to understand it. Here's a couple more things. Uh, great class, learned so much, thank you. And there's a musical quality to his writing, like a series of phrases building toward a larger idea. Yeah, if you're a fan of opera, you'll, you, might, you might hear uh, that 
influence on Whitman. You know, we have the pure contralto mentioned, but Whitman was a was an opera fan, and and so some of the the style of that um, uh, uh, has crept into his poetry. There's a book called uh, Walt Whitman and Opera that, in very mm -hmm. technical terms, shows how the operas that he witnessed influenced the way that he wrote the poetry, and and it's very musical. A lot of it has been set to music too. I find that uh, it, you'd make a great rapper. <laughs> the the way that I appreciated it so much for came with your reading it, because out loud it, it does make such a difference. It's unbelievable. Thank you. That's interesting. Um, that that rap is rap owes something to Whitman. I'm sure it does. It's the idea of the the poet as a performer, and a poet as a kind of spokesperson and prophet for the community that he or she is standing before. Well, I certainly enjoyed this. It makes me want to go read some more of his before next week. So I'll be sort of prepared. Um, and uh, although I did read some in college, I didn't remember zilch about it. So this has been really refreshing and, and wonderful. And, and I agree. The, the reading has been so nice. We don't get people reading to us much now that we're grown-ups, and it's it was very very nice. Um, so if you are um, those of you who are participating in the class, if you're eager to um, do an evaluation, that's cool. But you're going to have to wait until after next time, because um, then uh, an email will be sent out with an evaluation form from the HASP office. And then you are welcome to um, make an evaluation at that time. Of course, it's voluntary, but uh, any comments or um, compliments that you'd like to give, we always love to hear about those. So thank you so much, Dr. Panapacker. We're looking forward to next week. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you. It was beautiful. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>